Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Brinkley and welcome to my Common Risk Language series, part two. What is the standardized risk language? This video has been rated novice, which means it's accessible to everyone. If you have any questions or comments about the content or use of this video, please comment below or email me directly. So last time in part one of my series, we learned that risk wasn't a series of ordered categories. It wasn't a typology or a stepwise pyramid. In fact, when we went out into nature, we saw that risk was very naturally a dimension with no clear break points for us to use to make categorical decisions. Our job in risk assessment is to figure out where someone's place is on that dimension and then find a way to communicate that with others for decision making. The problem is dimensions don't lend themselves very well to categories or decisions, especially as policy and practice can vary by location. Lastly, we compared commonly used risk assessment tools and we saw gross discrepancies in how the risk levels are distributed and that there was very little agreement across tools. And that's where I left you. You know, actually kind of a jerk move, to be honest. You know, almost as bad as saying, I am your father. And then cutting to credits. In this video, I am going to introduce you to the standardized risk levels. This framework was led by my supervisor and mentor, Carl Hansen, and a team of researchers and professionals from Public Safety Canada, the United States Justice Center, Council of State Governments, and the National Reentry Resource Center. Risk levels are not defined in this framework by taking averages of risk tools, but by looking at the goals of correctional and legal policies and thinking about how to translate those into a meaningful risk framework using the language of recidivism rates and ratios, as well as supervision needs, treatment goals, and the capacity for change. This video is, and let me verbally underscore this, a summary. I have placed the links below for the full report, pictured here, its application to static 99R and 2002R, and a quick five minute blog I wrote for users who just want a quick summary of key points with tables and case examples. When I sit back and I think of this series of videos on the common risk language, the first video, the one before this one, is very much like the original Star Wars movie, you know, a blockbuster success, but just getting the ball rolling in terms of storyline. It's this movie that has the real meat of the narrative and like Empire Strikes Back will likely be the one to which most people refer. You know, it's the next video. It's really for those who want closure. As you see, this current video will end with a few lingering questions, and that may not bother some, but whenever I give presentations on the standardized risk levels, there are always a handful of people who come up to me afterwards and want to know a little more about how the levels are constructed. And just like Return of the Jedi, this third video will give you that closure. Before we begin our discussion on the standardized risk levels, I'm going to have to rip off a bandage and let you know that I will actually be talking about two parallel types of risk. Forever. And before you think of yourself as Han Solo being betrayed and handed over to Darth Vader, all I am saying is that one series of risk levels pertains to risk for general offending, and the second is specific to sexual offending. This type of distinction in risk should be familiar to most. It's like saying Bob's risk is high for new sexual offenses against children, but he has no history of non-sexual crime, and we have no evidence to believe his risk is of concern in that area. As you can see, there is a great deal of overlap between these two frameworks, but I will let you know when they are different. Whenever I think of the standardized risk levels, this is the visual that comes to mind. A continuous dimension with a spectrum of colors representing the gradual yet meaningful changes in risk from individuals at the one end who should be of little to no concern to those at the opposite end who are almost certainly going to commit a crime. Let's start at the beginning with level one. 
Level 1 is comprised of a small number of individuals whose risk for future offenses is of the least concern. They have no risk-relevant problems that I would want to address in treatment or supervision, and they have several strengths that encourage pro-social behavior. Individuals who are at level 1 upon release are often older with no prior history of crime. These individuals' risk of reoffending is so low that it is comparable with the general risk of individuals in the community. What is that threshold? Well, it depends. For general risk, it's around 5% after two years in the community. For sexual risk, we use a different threshold, a more conservative one. This threshold is one that removes the label of sex offender and makes them no different than the general correctional community, those individuals with a, a non-sexual criminal history. You know, if these numbers are hard to visualize, let me put it to you like this. The threshold for general risk is 5% after two years, meaning that after two years in the community, 5% of individuals will reoffend, or on the other hand, 95% of individuals will not. The threshold for sexual crime is 2% after five years, meaning that after five years in the community, only 2% of individuals will have new sexual offenses, and 98% will not. Let's move on to risk level two. We differentiate risk level two by that desistance threshold. Individuals at risk level two have a higher risk than the general community, and should be treated differently. Another feature that characterizes risk level two is that they have something to work on in treatment or supervision. For example, I had a client whose risk was at a level two. He had good family support, a job, no previous criminal record, but he had a substance use problem. And that substance use problem brought him into conflict with the law. This problem had been around for a bit, and although he usually could control it, he had been under stress lately and it had gotten out of hand. This is something he acknowledged and was motivated to work on in treatment. My expectation for him is that once he completed treatment successfully, he would be able to transition down to level one. Level three is another meaningful step up the risk dimension. This risk level is the largest in terms of number of individuals. It also represents the average or middle of the risk dimension. Individuals in this risk level have the same level of risk as the overall average of the correctional population. For general risk, that's around 30 to 40% after two years. And for sexual risk, that's around seven to 10% after five years. Individuals will have more than one problem and require more structured programs. Custody is appropriate to manage short-term issues in risk or get treatment started. After successfully completing treatment, some individuals will move down to level two, and some even may, after time free in the community, move down to level one, but that would not happen over the short term. Just to be clear about those average rates, for general crime, we are looking at 30 to 40% with new crimes after two years. That number may seem high until you remember that this includes drug possession, drug use, theft, driving under the influence, or with a suspended license. All things that can happen very quickly and are not violent in nature. For sexual crime, that 7 to 10% of individuals will be convicted of new offenses after five years. Conversely, 90 to 93% will not. So let's move on to level four, where we are going to see some marked differences between sexual and general risk. First, let me address general risk. The difference between level three and four is the number or severity of problems. These individuals have more chronic problems, less strengths or social support, and longer criminal histories. Custody would not be uncommon, and intensive treatment programs are recommended. After treatment and time free in the community, some would move down to level three, but it would take many years for their risk to decrease further. Many of these descriptions hold true for sexual crime, but the big differences have to do with the boundaries and the distances between levels three and five.
Now level five is our highest risk level. This level is similar to level one because they are both defined by absolute recidivism rates and very concrete policy concerns. Individuals at level five are almost certain to reoffend in the future. In fact, individuals at this risk level are likely to reoffend while in custody. You know, they have very entrenched criminal attitudes and behaviors and require intensive and long-term intervention to see meaningful decreases in risk. For most, Reductions in risk will only occur with aging. So we use this 85% roughly as a threshold for nearly certain, for both general and sexual crime. For general crime, that 85% threshold balances out the distribution of absolute risk. You can see if you think of level 3 as the middle, a risk ratio of 1, then you can see a rough doubling effect for each risk level so that the distances between levels 3, 4, and 5 are rather balanced. The same is actually not true for sexual crime. When you look at levels 1, 3, and 5, you see the relationship between 1 and 3 is that doubling effect I was talking about earlier, but level 5 is more than 8 times higher risk than level 3. That's a huge difference. So, if we fill in the other risk levels, we see that there is a wide expanse of risk represented by level four. So we divide level four in two parts based on two and four times the risk of level three. This gives us levels 4A and 4B. Now, the difference between all the levels is just quantitative, but this is especially true for levels 4A and 4B. A practical implication of this is that you can now measure changes in risk at the higher end of level 4 that doesn't quite drop them all the way into level 3, but is still meaningful. They would become a level 4A. Another note is that most sexual risk tools are not able to discriminate between levels 4B and 5 across that 85% threshold. This is for many reasons. One is that there are not a lot of guys, thankfully, who are at level five risk for sexual crime and released into the community. Another is that a lot of information is needed about risk to measure someone who is eight times higher risk than the average person. Most risk tools weren't designed with that in mind. As I wrap up, I'm mindful of how this complex discussion went. And to some of you, it may seem as elegant as this Carl Hansen lookalike writing math on the chalkboard. However, to some of you, I may look more like Charlie Day here. Lots of details, only some of which you were able to follow. Now, if you are curious and want a bit more understanding about the standardized risk levels, then tune in next week as I go into detail on how I would go about taking a risk tool and using it to measure the standardized risk levels. But until then, May the force be with you.